and here we are. Yeah. Oh, I just don't want to wake up the neighbors, so we got to be really quiet, you know. What? Of course we're alone. Who else would be here? This isn't what it looks like. This is for a video. So, play along. Hey folks, I'm Shay Parker and this is RTFM, the show where I teach you how to play a game. And where nothing else is going on, why would you even say that? Be cool. And today we are learning Eclipse, Second Dawn for the Galaxy. Now, around these parts, I tend to be known as the Twilight Imperium guy, and I certainly don't mind the association. So me teaching Eclipse, which is often referred to as the Euro TI, whatever that means, is either treason of the highest order, or me trying to show that there's room in this hobby for both games. I guess the comments section will decide. Now, I have my opinions on whether the comparison between the two is in any way useful, but that is a discussion for another video. In the meantime, instead of talking about what this game isn't, let's talk about what it is. Eclipse Second Dawn for the Galaxy is a space-based game for two to six players where you'll command powerful factions in a bid for galactic supremacy. You will explore and settle alien worlds, research and upgrade strange new technologies, and lead fleets of ships into perilous combat. At the end of the game, only one faction will be victorious, so if you want that to be you, you'll need to learn how to play. Okay, before we get started, there are two quick things. First off, just like Rado does it, I'll be putting any potential corrections in the Klingon subtitles, so please turn those on. You'll only see anything if I've got something to fix. And second, I want to thank my Patreon backers who voted on Eclipse for me to teach. If you have a game you'd like to see taught on RTFM, becoming a rules lawyer is the best way to make that happen. Now, let's get down to business. In Eclipse, you will play as one of six alien races, or if you want something more beginner-friendly, one of six flavors of human. The game plays for eight rounds, and each round, you and your friends will take a series of actions, which is where most of the game takes place, potentially get in fights, gain and spend resources, and set up for the next round. During the game, you will be exploring the galaxy, interacting with other players and NPCs, and generally trying to earn points in a number of different ways. But before we get into any of that, let's set things up. Now, I'm not going to cover all of setup because it's kind of tedious, and the rulebook is pretty clear, if a bit intricate. However, there are a few important choices to cover, and a few changes depending on your player count. We'll start by putting out technologies. Depending on how many players you have, and let's say we have four, draw an amount of tech tiles and place them on the tech board in their matching rows. If you have repeats, just stack them on top of each other, and if you pull any rare techs during this process, place it on the bottom row and draw another one. Every game will have NPCs, so next we need to determine their strength. Each NPC's combat abilities are determined by these matching blueprint tokens. You'll need to choose one for each, and you can randomize it, but for your first game, it's recommended you use the basic blueprints. Once this is done, choose a first player, and then, starting with the last player and going up in reverse order, everyone chooses a faction and takes its corresponding faction board and component tray. Open this up and distribute your starting stuff so it looks like this. If you're playing with four players or more, like we are, you'll need to keep these ambassador tiles nearby, but for a two or three player game, you can leave them in the box. Your faction board will show your starting resources in materials, science, and money, so match that on your resources track. You'll get three or four colony ships, depending on your faction, which you'll keep nearby. And if you're playing an alien, you'll see a few other symbols referring to any special abilities or conditions you may have, which are all detailed in the rulebook. Each faction also has a starting sector, so let's look at the map. Since we have a four-player setup going, two pairs of players are near each other, separated by Guardian Worlds and the big scary GCDS at the center. Different player counts will obviously have different setups, but there's always going to be a lot of empty space. That'll be filled in during the game, so make sure you have stacks of inner, middle, and outer sectors nearby. For the ones and twos, you'll take all the tiles in the box, but the amount of outer sectors is determined by player count, so we'll have 14. Now let's zoom in a bit. On your starting sector, you'll place one of your influence discs, showing that you control it. And you see these squares matching the different resources? These slots will hold population, so take a cube from the matching population wheel and place it on each basic space. As you can see, this has increased our money, science, and materials production by one. Most starting sectors will also have advanced population squares, but these need matching technologies to use, so unless you start with that, like the Hydrant Progress do, leave the advanced squares blank for now. Lastly, place one of your interceptors in your home sector and this action phase tile near your faction board. And then, after the rest of the setup that I skipped, you're ready to go. So let's learn about how to take actions. All right, we've set things up, now it's time to start doing stuff. During the action phase, in turn order, each player will take an action by placing a disc from their influence track onto one of these six action spaces. 
Under each action space is a number, which shows the amount of activations you get every time you perform the action. So, for example, because humans have a three under movement, every time you take this action, you'll get to move three times. All humans are the same, but the aliens are better or worse at specific actions. Let's start with explore, because it's usually one of the first actions you'll take in the game. As you'll recall, there's all this empty space around the sectors we've put out. When you take the explore action, you'll choose a space adjacent to one of these wormhole halves and draw a tile matching the appropriate sector. Now, some people will have this fancy schmancy play mat that shows where the sectors are supposed to go, but since I don't, and you might not either, just know that the spaces around the center are for inner sectors, the ring around that, where your home system goes, is for middle sectors, and anything beyond that will get outer sectors. Let's explore in the middle ring, so we'll grab one of these two tiles and flip it over. Epsilon Indy. Not the flashiest place in the galaxy, but I've seen worse. Placing it adjacent to our sector, we can rotate it however we like, so long as it connects to the sector we explored from with the second half of a wormhole. So this is fine, but this would not be a legal placement. Now, you don't have to place the sector if you don't like it. You can choose to discard it instead, but that will still end your activation. When you place a sector, you may find a couple of different things. If you see this shape, that means that you'll place a discovery tile on the sector. If you can acquire this tile, it might earn you resources, technologies, ships, all kinds of things. They're always good, but sometimes they're defended by one or two ancients, alien NPCs that defend the sector. All sectors have a point value, and some will show a little silver star. These are artifacts, and they aren't worth anything on their own, but some game effects will make use of them. Now, if the sector doesn't have any enemies, as part of the explore action, you can immediately place a disc from your influence track onto the sector. And if it has a discovery tile, whether you placed influence or not, you immediately take it. Flip it over and choose whether you want to gain its reward or keep it face down. If you take the reward, immediately gain its benefit, though if it's an ancient ship part, you can install it right away or hold onto it for later. If you keep it face down, you won't ever gain the reward, but you will get two points for it at the end of the game. Anyway, now that you control the sector, you'll be able to colonize here. If you recall, we started the game with a few colony ships, and as a free action, you can flip over these tokens to move population cubes from their various tracks onto a matching planet. Again, some planets are advanced, so you'll need the right tech to send people there, and some planets don't have a type, meaning that you can choose which population track you pull from. Sometimes your population will return from these planets, and if you're returning from a gray planet, these cubes can go back to any track, regardless of where they came from. You just can't fill the last population space. Moving on to research, this is how we're going to turn our wimpy little civilization into something special. Whether you want to be efficient and industrious, powerful and imposing, or an affront to God and science, there is something here for you. We take the research action like any other by spending one influence disc, and for each activation we have, you can research one technology by paying its cost in science. We've already randomly drawn a few texts during setup, so on our first turn, this is what we see. These technologies have symbols and icons that tell you what they do, but you can also find a complete list in the manual. One thing that each tech shares, though, is an initial cost and a minimum cost. The initial cost is how much science you'll pay for the tech, but it's possible to get a discounted rate. However, no matter how big your discounts are, you'll always have to pay at least the minimum. Now, each technology belongs to one of four families. Military, grid, nano, and rare. These kind of give you a sense of what they're about, but mostly they just determine which row of the tech tray and your player board the tiles will be placed on. Looking back at our good little humans, we see that we start with the star-based technology, which is in the military row. Looking at the space to the right, we see a minus one. This is the discount we'll get the next time we research a military tech, and it increases the more you research along this line. Rare techs don't have a row of their own, though. When you research a rare tech, choose which row it will be placed on using any discounts you would receive. So now, if we researched this transition drive and called it a military tech, we'd only have to pay seven science. But if we wanted to place it in a different row, we wouldn't get that discount. And it's also worth noting that if you can put a lot of technologies down, you'll earn a few points for them during the end game. But you can't research the same tech twice. Okay, that's all well and good, but what do they do? Well, technologies have three basic uses. Ongoing abilities, like this one that lets you colonize advanced economy planets. Immediate effects, like advanced robotics, which gives you an extra influence disc. And ship parts, of which there are a lot. Researching ship parts will allow you to change your blueprints, which you do by taking the upgrade action. Spend an influence disc as normal, and for each activation, you can add one ship part to one of your blueprints. There are some basic parts that everyone can build from the start of the game, but beyond that, you'll need to research parts in order to add them to your blueprints. The exception is ancient ship parts, which you find under some discovery tiles. As I mentioned earlier, when you get these, you can add them right away or hold on to them. 
If you hold on to them, you'll need to take an upgrade action to add them to a blueprint, and because these are unique, you'll only be able to use it once. Parts can be removed or overwritten, but they can't be moved from ship to ship, so make sure you know where you want a part to go before you place it. Now you start with some puny little rock throwers, but they can be upgraded to deadly war machines with the right parts. We'll talk more about how each of these parts work when we get to combat, but for now, just know that each ship must have a drive and enough energy to power every part on the ship. The drive allows the ship to move, and you can't add a part if it would exceed your total energy. The Starbase is a little different though. It's stationary, so you actually can't give it a drive, and it has extra power, so while you can install more, you don't need to at the start. Once an upgrade has been made, all ships matching the blueprint have access to its new capabilities. But in order to get these ships in the first place, you need to build them, which is our next action. After spending an influence, you can build one thing for each activation by paying its cost in materials, which can be found on your faction board, and then placing whatever you want to build on a sector you control. It doesn't matter if there are enemy ships in the sector, as long as you control it, you can build there. Anyone can make the basic ships, but you'll need specific technologies in order to build star bases, orbitals, or monoliths. Monoliths will earn you points at the end of the game if you can hold onto them, and orbitals will hold a population cube from either your science or economy tracks. If this population is returned, it can go back to either science or money, but not materials. Orbitals and monoliths are structures, which means they can't be destroyed, but also that you only control them if you control the sector. If someone takes the sector from you, they'll get the structure too, so be careful. Moving on to moving, when you take this action, for each activation you have, you get to make one movement, which involves moving one ship a number of sectors up to its move speed. At the start of the game, all ships have a speed of one, but with upgrades, you can build a real hot rod if you want. Since we have three movement activations, we can make three moves, so let's look at the map. In order to move from sector to sector, they must be connected by a complete wormhole. If you have the wormhole generator tech, you can move through halves of a wormhole, but that's pretty expensive and we're still in the early game. Now let's say we want to get to this sector so we can fight this ancient. Unfortunately, another player's ship is in the way. We can move a ship into this space, but now it's pinned. Each enemy ship will pin one of yours and vice versa. And when you're pinned, you can't move out of the space. Let's use our second activation to move our other ship in. Now, one of our ships is pinned, but the other can escape. And since we have one more move activation, we'll use it to leave the system. After the action phase is finished, all ships sharing a sector with other players or NPCs will have combat, so keep that in mind when moving. And two more quick things. First, the GCDS will pin all ships in the sector. And second, there's an optional module you can play with that introduces warp portals. A system with a warp portal is considered adjacent to all other warp portal systems. This can be a little tricky to strategize around, so if you don't want to play with it, make sure to remove all components that have this symbol on them during setup. And the last action we have to talk about is influence. This one doesn't get used as often as the others, but it can be very important. This action does two things, and every species has two activations for it. The main use for the influence action is moving your influence discs around. You can move a disc from your influence track, or any sector you control, to your influence track, or any sector within reach. Sectors are within reach for the influence action if they are connected to a system you control via a wormhole, or if you have a ship in that sector. But they need to be otherwise unoccupied. If there's another player or NPC in the system, you can't claim it. Influence is great for snatching up extra systems, but if you remove influence from a system you control, you'll have to return all of the population cubes to their respective tracks. Sometimes that's worth it, but it is a big decision. The other thing influence lets you do is flip over two colony ships. Normally, this is done during the upkeep phase, so if you're able to colonize a lot of planets, you might want to use this action so you can get population on the board more quickly. And keep in mind that you can use colony ships in the middle of your turn, so if you acquire a new system through influence, you can use those colony ships at any point during your action. Now you take an action every time your turn comes up, but there is a cost in money that will be triggered later, and it increases the more influence discs you've spent, either through actions or colonization, so eventually you're going to want to stop. In that case, when your turn comes up, you can pass, flipping over your action phase summary tile to show this. If you're the first player to pass, you'll gain the first player token, meaning you'll take the first action next round, and you'll gain two money. The action phase will end once everyone has passed, but unlike most other games, after you've passed, you're still able to participate. The next time your turn comes around, you can perform a reaction. You can upgrade, build, or move, but regardless of your faction or any techs that increase your capabilities, you only get one activation for each reaction. Of course, you don't have to take a reaction, you can keep passing and wait for the round to be over. 
Now we're almost done with the action phase. I just want to talk diplomacy real quick. No, not that one. See, if you're playing with four or more players, you each have ambassadors that you can trade with each other. If you and another player have adjacent sectors connected by either a complete wormhole or a warp portal, and you both agree to it, you can exchange ambassadors as a free action, placing the one you receive on an open ambassador space. These spaces can hold either ambassador or reputation tiles, which we haven't talked about yet, but if the space looks like either of these, it can only hold one or the other. Now, there are two reasons to engage in diplomacy. First, if you still have the tile at the end of the game, you get a point. Nice. But also, each ambassador has a space for a population cube, and when you give a player an ambassador, you'll also place one of your population from any track on the tile. And if you ever get that population back, you can return it to any track, just like with the gray planets. This all sounds pretty great, but there are a couple restrictions. As I mentioned, you need to have an open space for the ambassador. Second, you can only have one ambassador per player. I don't care how cool your brother is, he wasn't invited. Third, you can't propose diplomatic relations with a player if you have ships in the same sector. And lastly, you can't start diplomatic relations with a player if either of you have the traitor tile. And you get the traitor tile by breaking diplomatic relations. See, as long as two players get along, the ambassadors they exchange will be on each other's player boards for the rest of the game. But if one of these players performs an act of aggression, which is defined as ending an action with one of your ships in a sector that your buddy controls or has ships in, that breaks your diplomatic relations, and whoever performed the act of aggression gets the traitor tile. This is bad not only because you can't start any new alliances, but also because if you're still the traitor at the end of the game, you'll lose two points. The only way to pass this token along is if someone else commits an act of aggression and breaks their own diplomatic relations. And since we're talking about aggression, now seems like a perfect time to get into combat. So once every player has passed, you move on to the combat phase, which has six parts. Determine battles, resolve battles, attack population, influence sectors, discovery tiles, and repair damage. It sounds like a lot, but after the first two, these go really fast. Now, every player who has ships in the same sector as an opponent's or NPC's ships will have a battle. To determine the order, look at the numbers on each battle sector. Higher numbers resolve first, and because there's a numbering convention at work here, you'll start in the outer sectors and work your way in. Next, you'll need to determine the attacker and the defender. If one player controls the sector, they're automatically the defender. But if it's uncontrolled, the defender is the player who entered the space first during the action phase. It's possible to have more than two faction ships in one sector, but battles are only ever between two players. Let's say a sector looks like this, where green came in first, then white, then blue. Blue and white would have a battle first, with blue as the attacker and white defending. The winner of that fight would then attack green. If it looks like this, even if the green ships enter the sector last, because they control it, they'll always be the defender and fight in the last battle here. The same goes for NPCs in a sector. Okay, so now that we've determined who's going to fight and in what order, it's time to actually come to blows. Each fight takes place over a series of engagement rounds, wherein each type of ship will attack or retreat based on its initiative. Once only one player's ships are in the sector, the fight is over. Initiative is determined by the number of arrows on the ship's blueprints, which are mostly due to innate abilities and engine parts. Our interceptor here has three initiative, while our cruisers, because we've upgraded the engines a bit, have four. Let's say our opponent also has ships with four initiative, but ties are broken in favor of the defender, and since we control the system, that's us. So the order during the fight will go our cruisers, their cruiser, our interceptor, their interceptor. But before combat starts, any ships with missiles get to fire them once in initiative order, after which missiles won't be used for the rest of combat. Our interceptor swapped out its cannon for these plasma missiles, and is the only ship with missiles in the fight, so we fire those first. All attacks work the same way. You find the dice matching the weapon you're using, so in our case, two orange dice, and roll them. A blank is a miss, and a burst symbol is a hit. And with orange dice, a hit deals two damage, because there are two burst symbols. However, each die also has the numbers two through five on them. These might hit, depending on your targeting computers and their shields. Computers on your blueprints will increase the value of each die, while enemy shields will decrease them. The target is six or higher, and let's say we rolled a five and a two. Each die is counted individually, so with our plus two computer, we know that only the five has a chance of hitting. They have a minus one shield, so five plus two minus one is six, and we score a hit, again, dealing as much damage as the strength of the die we're using. When you score hits, you get to choose where that damage is going. You can't split damage from a single die between ships, and if you destroy one ship with damage left over, it doesn't carry over to the next. Ships can take an amount of damage equal to their hull value, 
Any more than that, and the ship is destroyed. Our opponent's interceptors don't have any hull, so if they took the hit, one damage destroys it and the other damage is lost. And whenever you destroy an enemy ship, take it as a trophy. Now that missiles have been fired, we move on to the combat round. Again, rolling damage for cannons works the same way as missiles, but if the fight lasts for a while, you'll be able to use them more than once. Let's say both of our cruisers and theirs all missed, and it's time for our interceptor to go. However, since it doesn't have any cannons and its missiles have been shot, it can't actually fight anymore. We could leave it in the sector to, I don't know, twiddle its thumbs, but instead we're going to retreat. To do this, you must have an adjacent reachable sector that you control with no enemy ships in it. So this system would work, but not either of these. And because we don't have wormhole generators, we can't reach this other sector. To show that we intend to retreat, we place our ship on the neighboring border. When you do this, all ships of the matching type must retreat. You can't have some go and some stay. Also, even if we did have cannons, you can't take any shots if you're retreating. After we've declared a retreat, those ships must survive until their next turn in the battle in order to actually leave. But once they do, they're out of the fight and home safe. Now our cruisers are still in the battle, and let's say one has been hit for one damage. Because our cruisers have one hull, it can take the hit, but we put a damage cube next to the ship to keep track. After a tense battle, our cruisers come out victorious, again taking the enemy ship as a trophy when it's destroyed. After all battles in the sector are complete, each player will earn a reputation tile. For simply participating in the fight, each player gets to draw one, but for each ship you destroyed, you'll get to draw more. Check this reference card to see how many based on which trophies you have. However, you can draw a maximum of five tiles. We destroyed a cruiser and an interceptor, which get us three more. These tiles are worth between one and four points, so once you have all of them, secretly look at and keep one, placing it on a reputation tile space. If your spaces are full, you can replace a worse tile or choose not to keep it, but you can't replace an ambassador with a reputation. Once you've made your choice, place all unused tiles back in the bag. And there's one caveat. If your battle ended because your last ship in the sector retreated, you don't get the participation bonus, but you do still draw tiles for each ship you destroyed. Lastly, combat with NPCs works the same way as combat with players. Simply have another player roll for the NPC ships using their blueprint tiles to determine combat values. Okay, now that the battle is over, it's time to commit war crimes. Yeah, so if you're in someone else's system and it's undefended, you get to attack their population by making one attack roll with the non-missile weapons of each of your ships in the sector. Population cubes have zero shield value, and each damage inflicted will destroy one population. Destroyed population is returned to the resource tray, but instead of going right on the track, place it in the corresponding graveyard instead. If at the end of the combat phase you have ships in a system controlled by someone else, but with no population, even if no combat happened there, return their influence disc back to their faction board and, if you want to, place one of your own in the sector. Next, if you have ships in a system with a discovery tile, congratulations, it's yours now. And lastly, any leftover damage on your ships is repaired. And that's combat! Up next, we just have some admin to do, and then we'll figure out who wins. Okay, so we've taken a ton of actions, gotten in some cool fights, everything is great, and oh god, we owe how much money? So here's the thing. You can take as many actions as you have influence, but the bill really hits you in the upkeep phase, because the more influence discs you put out, the more you owe. But before we pay the bill, there is one more thing to do, and it might just help with the whole debilitating debt thing. At the beginning of upkeep, you may use any remaining colony ships you have to send population cubes to vacant spots you control. Very useful if you just picked up a new system during combat. However, unlike during the action phase, you can't send your people to sectors with enemy ships in them. So if someone destroyed some of your population, you can't refill it just yet. Anyway, back to our debt. We look at the rightmost empty space on our influence track to find out how much we owe. In this case, five credits. That's perfectly manageable. Looking at our resources tray, we make four credits per round, so when you put it all together, we really only owe one, which we have, easy as pie. But let's say our board and resources look more like this, and now we're in trouble. We've taken too many actions, we haven't increased our money production to match, and we don't have much of a stockpile. We'll currently need six more money to pay our upkeep, so what happens next? You're not allowed to just go bankrupt, so the first thing you do is sell your stuff. God, what a depressing sentence I wrote. Anyway. At any point during the game, you can trade resources at the rate shown on your faction board. Humans have a good rate of two for one, so we could trade four materials and two science for three money. We still have one material and one science, but you can't mix and match, so that's all we get out of trading and we're still three money short. If you can't or don't want to trade enough resources to cover your costs, your other option is abandoning sectors. 
This returns a disk to our influence track, which reduces our debt. Yay! But if you'll recall, it also returns our population cubes, and if any of them go to your money track, you have to take that into account when determining how much you owe. So now even though we have to pay three less, we also make two less, and we have to abandon another system. This drops our total costs to seven, which our newly lowered income and all the money we have left can just barely pay for. Now in the unlikely event that you can't pay off your costs, even after abandoning all your sectors, you're eliminated from the game. I've never actually seen this happen, but it can, so keep an eye on that while taking your actions. Once you've paid off your civilization upkeep, earn materials and science based on their production tracks and move on to the cleanup phase. During cleanup, you'll return all influence disks from your action track to your influence track, Draw new tech tiles from the bag, just like we did during setup, but drawing a few less this time around. Flip all colony ships and summary tiles face up. And lastly, advance the round marker. Of course, if this was the end of the eighth round, you don't need to do any of that other stuff. Just proceed to end game scoring. During scoring, you'll earn points for your reputation tiles, ambassador tiles, each controlled sector, any monoliths you have on controlled sectors, any discovery tiles you chose to keep for their point value, if you made enough progress on any of your tech tracks, and lastly, you'll lose two points if you end the game with the traitor tile. Also, a couple alien races have unique endgame scoring conditions, so keep an eye out for those. Count them all up, and whoever has the most is the winner. Or, if there's a tie, whichever tied player has the most total resources wins. And that's how you play Eclipse! I want to give another big thank you to my Patreon backers who chose this game for me to teach. They've also decided that the next game I cover will be Oath, Chronicles of Empire and Exile, which I'm very excited about. That's right, I actually know what's coming next which tells you how behind schedule I am. Anyway, if you want to help me choose which games I teach or get early access to videos like the Beginner Strategy Guide I'll be posting very soon, please head on over to the Patreon and become a rules lawyer. Either way, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.